seemed to want to create the perfect murder. He didn't. What went wrong? Evidence against Brian Koberger is overwhelming. And that actually is a factor in that decision. Essentially, when people weigh the death penalty, elected DAs, they look for two things. They look for overwhelming evidence, absolutely no doubt of guilt, because the jury will be allowed to consider that. Why did he murder these young people? What is the effect on the town, on the families? Uh, he wanted to create, seemed to want to create the perfect murder. He didn't. What went wrong? This is Reporter Room with Jessica Della Davies. Oh my gosh, you guys, today we have so much stuff to get into. Let's get started. Today, we're going to be discussing the latest motion by Brian Kohlberger's attorney, Ann Taylor, Brian's employment history, and some of the interesting things that stand out. Now, Brian also has an alleged voyeur history, and we're going to talk about how this relates directly to Xana Carnodal and the role that this will play in Brian's upcoming trial, along with the gag order and some key dates for you guys to keep in mind. Everyone is innocent until proven guilty, and everything I'm sharing is my opinion. So Brian Kohlberger's attorney, Ann Taylor, filed a motion in Lataw County District Court stating that his defense team had not had enough time to fully review the prosecution's evidence. Now, Ann Taylor stated that the evidence includes, quote, thousands of pages of discovery, thousands of photographs, and hundreds of hours of recordings, end quote. She writes that the defense team needs more time to go through the, quote, thousands of pages of discovery, thousands of photographs, hundreds of hours of recordings, and many gigabytes of electronic phone record and social media data. So it does seem like the prosecution has turned over a lot of information, which debunks the naysayers who have been saying the prosecution is withholding evidence from the defense. So under Idaho law, Brian would normally have around 10 days to offer up information on whether or not he plans to provide an alibi to prove or show that he was not at the 1122 King Road house on the night that Maddie, Ethan, Zana, and Kaylee were done away with. Now, the burden of proof rests with the prosecution, but if he's going to provide an alibi, he needs to offer it. And this would include specific information about where Brian was, along with any other witness names and contact information that could help attest to this information. It's interesting that the defense has yet to offer up an alibi and instead is requesting an extension. Is this a delay tactic or does Brian not have an alibi? We're also going to discuss Brian's employment history and a job application and how this relates back to Xana Kernodal in just a second, so please stay with me. Brian's attorney, Ann Taylor, wants this deadline to be extended by Judge John Judge. A former job application form completed by Brian shows that Brian claims to have knife skills and to have boxing experience. This is an application for a job back in 2015 as a school security guard in the Pleasant Valley School District of Pennsylvania, and it details both previous employment history as well as some of Brian's hobbies. And under the section headed, quote, describe any specialized training, skills, and extracurricular activities, Brian put, I boxed after school every day, and he says where. So this is interesting because it does show you that Brian would have had the stamina. I've heard a lot of people try to claim that one person could not have committed all of these acts, but the fact that he had this boxing experience would have given him a lot of stamina. We also know that Brian had this job filleting fish, according to News Nation, so he would have been comfortable also with a knife. In fact, Brian describes his role as a fish cutter, putting, quote, I cut the fish to the specifications of the customers. So it does seem like he was experienced. Now, everyone is innocent until proven guilty, and Brian has not had his day in court yet. However, I do think that this shows that he would have had the stamina to commit these crimes on his own, and he would have been comfortable with the weapon that was used. Brian also put on his application, quote, I was a boxer and am still a runner. So, I believe that this shows that he did have the stamina boxing and running take a lot of stamina to do something and I'm going to talk about the gag order and 
peeping Tom Voyeur behavior of Brian Kohlberger that's been alleged, along with how this relates back to Xander Cronodal in just a second. But being a boxer and runner would have taken a lot of stamina and having a job cutting and filleting fish would have made him very comfortable with that knife. So let's talk about peeping Tom's and Voyeur behaviors and how these help the prosecution to build their case and how it all relates back to Xander Cronodal. And then we're going to discuss that gag order. So we know that Brian allegedly installed a surveillance system in a female colleague's apartment prior to the November 13th, 2022 murders. And according to both Deadline and Raider Online, Brian became friends with a woman who went to Washington State University. This is the same university where he was working as a teaching assistant, the same university that fired him. So he is suspected of breaking into her apartment and, quote, moving items around. Now, this brings me back to one of the last things that Xana's dad did on behalf of his precious daughter, which was change the locks on her door. Did Santa tell her dad that someone was in her room and is this why those locks were changed? Obviously, Xana's father cannot speak out due to the gag order on the case, but I think that it's very interesting and I would like to know the reason of why those locks were changed at that time. It will be yet another set of circumstantial evidence in this case against Brian Kohlberger. So at the time that Brian allegedly broke into this young woman at Washington State University's house, she did not know that it was him. In fact, she was so upset that she reached out to him to install security cameras. So did he gaslight her into installing a surveillance system and then proceed to use that same surveillance system to spy on her? This is something that we talked about in one of my live streams, the fact that peeping Tom's voyeurs, how this escalates and the fact that it does have an SA element. And as I shared with you in a prior video about how being a peeping Tom used to be viewed as harmless. However, we've come to learn that this fixation on victims escalates. We also did an informal poll with all of you guys and you overwhelmingly shared that you believed that Brian had been out to the 1122 King Road property and inside the house prior to November 13th of 2022. Now I shared with you that the house was a goldfish bowl from the parking lot which sits behind the house. From this parking lot Brian would have had an outstanding view into the 1122 King Road house and did he become fixated on one or more of the young women living inside the home. The Washington State University student said that she contacted Brian to install a security system and sadly did not report this incident to law enforcement. So if Brian did this, how would he have felt? He would have felt an increasing power over this young woman. He would have enjoyed the fact that she was afraid. He would have enjoyed the power that he felt over her. He got to come in as the rescuer. He got to install a new security system and he used it to spy on her. And again, the fact that he was watching her on camera surveillance allegedly would have made him feel very powerful, and I do believe there was an essay gratification related to this. So we've not heard anything about cameras at the 112 King Road house. However, that back parking lot and a pair of binoculars would have provided someone with lots of opportunities to peep in on Kaylee, Maddie, Zana and the other roommates, in my opinion. So I think with each one of these pieces of evidence, people can dismiss one or two, but I think it's starting to become cumulative. It's starting to build up and it's going to become harder and harder to dismiss all of these things together because what I think the prosecution is going to do with their circumstantial case is show a pattern of behavior. They're going to show someone that went from being a peeping Tom to installing cameras and they have those cell phone pings proving that Brian was near the 1122 King Road house. We don't know if they have CCTV footage that they would have gathered from other business cameras that prove that he was there. And Brian has not provided any alibi and he was arrested months ago. So he's had plenty of time to come up with an alibi in my opinion.
I'm going to talk more about this in a second, but let's discuss the judge and the gag order and some key dates that were provided by the New York Times and former FBI agent Jennifer Hoffendaffer. So, on December 19th, Brian identified and connected to the white Elantra, and he was fired from that teaching position at Washington State University. December 23rd, Brian's cell phone records were received by law enforcement. December 27th, DNA from Brian's dad was connected through genetic genealogy back to the touch DNA on the knife sheath snap found next to Maddie. On December 30th, Brian was arrested at his parents' home in Albrightsville, Pennsylvania. So it looks like law enforcement moved in really quickly. So the judge on the gag order is named John Judge. So John Judge is expected to rule on the gag order motion. And as you will recall, prosecutors, defense attorneys for the case, as well as witnesses are all prohibited from speaking to media outlets on anything new. In other words, they can't bring up anything that's not already public knowledge. Now, media outlets would love to get some more information on this case, so they are requesting that this gag order be lifted. And the Gonzalez family attorney, Shannon Gray, would also like to speak out, and he is requesting that the gag order be lifted also. Attorney Shannon Gray feels like this gag order is going too far. So both the prosecution and the defense both want the gag order to remain in place. So I think they want to make sure that Brian, one, has an opportunity for a fair trial, and two, that the case, the state's case against Brian, is protected from being leaked to the public, possibly tainting the jury pool. So Ann Taylor is formally requesting for an extension on whether or not they plan to present an alibi. And in her response to the state of Idaho law that requires the defense to formally request this, she says she's still going through all of the evidence. She describes it as being voluminous. So it sounds like the state has a lot of information. And I do think that Judge John Judge will rule that the gag order remain in place. I will be very surprised if he lifts it. So Brian's trial is currently set for October. However, do you think a plea deal could be reached in this case? Is this why Brian stood silent? Subscribe.